I see a lot of folks here are interested in magic. <laughs> and this interest has been rather general for a long time. You may probably remember that in uh, about 87 or 6, there came out a new version of the Holy Bible to be read in churches. And in that new edition, this new one just out, it states very firmly that three astrologers saw his star and came to venerate him. Now, this is going to be a blow to somebody, but not much, I don't think. It's really more important to save the civilization than it is to quibble. Now, the astrologers were magi, and the magi of Persia were the source of practically all of the esoteric tradition that drifted into Europe. They were very wise in many things, and their wisdom went back a long way. And among their various achievements were not only astrology and divination, but also a series of very practical discoveries and explanations that will be of service to us today. Three forms of magic were recognized. White magic, a sort of gray-colored magic, and black magic. The Magi of Persia were essentially white magicians. They used their arts and their wisdom and their skills for the service of humanity. But like most ancient nations, they had their problems. In the old days, the contact of the human being with his environment was very hazardous. There was no philosophical background to depend on, no regulated theology to lean upon. Each individual had to face the problems of life with whatever courage or insight he possessed. And early in the development of early civilizations, there came around the idea of a medicine priest, a priestly clan, which is perhaps best known for its part in the development of the American Indian structure in North America. It was recognized that there were holy people born with a peculiar gift of some kind. And these holy ones became priests. Now, they were not priests as we would know them now. They were not ordained to a ministry or something. They were priests because they could talk with the olds or with the spirits or they could see things that others couldn't see, or they could find out where the buffalo were. Such a one was Sitting Bull, who was a medicine priest for his entire lifetime, practically. And all that time he lived as one small tribe, and he predicted for them, and he worked with their sick, and he prepared them for their journey into the afterlife. He even went with them, according to legends and help them to make the crossing to that world beyond, where the campfires are in the sky, stars. The priests of that type were an absolutely essential part of civilization. They made it possible. The average person was frightened. He had no securities, no protections, and no insights. He had to depend upon something, and that something was early the medicine priest. Now, the medicine priest, in turn, had to depend upon something. He had to depend either upon the insights which he possessed within his own nature, or make use of symbols and figures and signs and various talismans to enforce his beliefs or teachings. Not very long ago, we noticed in one of our prominent journals a whole page devoted to the classification of available charms that you can buy right now. These charms will do almost everything. They will help you to face the future, or they will take care of housemaid's need. Whatever you may have, you can get a charm for it. A, an exposition was made in London, a survey was taken, and 40% of the London school children carried charms with them every day. Now because we still have the uncertainties. And in these critical times, the uncertainties become more immediate. 
probably we were never as troubled as we are today, even in primitive times. In those days, we didn't know enough to be troubled as we are now. But we are finding more and more that we are not able to handle the situation. We cannot cope with the skullduggery that is going on in society. And the average person, like the average primitive human being, must seek some solace, some consolation, and some source of inner strength. And out of that came the most interesting of all art, perhaps, fetish art art to convey to the individual a certain strength due to its own designs. The Egyptians were masters of fetish art. So were the Gnostics. Most of the Oriental people are strongly developed in it. It is to carry something, have something, say something, no words or formulas by means of which you can meet unexpected emergencies. Now the uh, attainment of this type of security is of course open to considerable psychological speculation. It's very possible that the fact that we believe in the charm gives it an efficacy. That we believe in it and we gain a strength from our believing. We support a weakness in our own nature and are able to face things a little better or a little more securely than we could without this symbolical help. Now, my objects around the people of old days were used for making such charms. The turquoise charms of the American and Central American Indians also drifted into Tibet and were used for all sites of medical, spiritual, ethical problems. We also noticed another peculiarity. Nothing in its native state is magical. It has to have something done to it so that it becomes something different. And I saw a very good example of that on Navajo Reservation. Two little stones, about the size of a nickel each, were very pretty little stones. The children played with them. But then came the time when something was necessary. A new charm had to be fashioned. So the two little stones were laid one on top of the other and a loop of rawhide was put around to hold them together. Immediately they were not two little stones anymore. Now they had the power of the olds, the powers of the trues, the powers of the goods. By carrying that little charm around you gain some kind of spiritual strength or consolation. You were able to face the day with greater bravery. And if it's happened that you were going into battle, you felt you had a greater chance of survival. Charms of this kind and fetishes were very, very common in Europe. In the days of the great uh, Crusades, there were a great many pilgrims that went to the Far East and Near East in search of religious consolation. All the way along the line there were dangers. And many of these pilgrims wore symbolic forms or figures in their hats to protect them. At first they began by using gold or silver medals attached to the hat, but many of them were held up and killed for the gold medals. So they became finally merely paper symbols. But if you had that on your hat, you had a better chance of getting to Jerusalem. And you probably had no actually better chance, but you approached life with a greater positive sense of strength. So the charm and the fetish were strength symbols. They helped us to go on and do things we did not believe to be possible. In medicine, it's the placebo. It is a little capsule of nothing but ground white flour. If you take it, it'll cure all kinds of diseases that you do not have. You think you have them? So this helps you. Everywhere there is a magical value in the unknown. There is something that if you can visualize it as useful or helpful, can do wonderful things. This is the secret of holy relics. No one knows how efficacious they really are. But that they have resulted in miraculous circumstances cannot be denied. We do not know just how the healings of Lourdes and Sananda de Beaupre are achieved. But certainly, the Belief is important. The charm, their symbolism, the prayer, 
and a physical action to make all these things into one pattern gives the individual a strength that he does not otherwise possess. Now white magic in its essential form must be virtuous. White magic is that which serves without hurting. It is that which accomplishes good and is never used for any other purpose. White magic is the use of the powers of life, the powers of nature, and even the ordinary faculties of the mind for the perpetuation of constructive imagery. It is necessary, therefore, that all white magic, in order to retain its nature, must be backed by a strong moral character. This is something that has been very common throughout Asia, where most of the dedicated mendicants, the holy men, have achieved a kind of white magic by gaining complete control over their own minds, their own emotions, or their own actions. These people, to remain white magicians, would under no conditions pervert, corrupt, or compromise the principles which they hold sacred. Therefore, a life dedicated to certain spiritual principles gains also a strength. And this strength can be considered as magical because it involves faculties that cannot be completely classified. No one can be sure what happens. But if something does happen, then in some mysterious way, an energy that resides in nature is made available to the human being. And it is generally known and widely respected that where dedication results in a greater interior enlightenment, the individual does perform heroic services for mankind. So white magic is the use of every power that we know for the service of good. It is the ability to learn but never abuse what is learned. And it is that the highest of all learning is that which is dedicated to unselfish purposes. White magic is not used to help oneself. It is assumed, however, that properly used for other purposes, it brings with it a security of the inner self. The individual who serves gradually gains the realization that a divine power in himself is making this service possible. And it is this divine power which then becomes the leader of his life. In this way, we have a great many very wonderful examples of dedication and the fact that these dedications in their turn have contributed tremendously to the advancement and survivals of civilized orders and peoples. Now, in uh, white magic, therefore, the individual must realize that the principal energy upon which he depends is not his own. The energy is within himself. It is a soul power. It is a divine energy within himself. And any use that, that he makes of this divine energy must be worthy of its source, the light of God and the light of truth. If this is perverted and the individual becomes self-centered, and turns these energies for the advancement of his own purposes, he goes against the statement long made, others him he could help, but himself he could not save. Therefore, the individual who uses the divine power is forbidden by the law itself to use it for himself, but by using it for others he reaps a virtue within himself. Always the motive becomes the basis of the difference between these various types of discipline. If the motive is personal, the achievement is much lower, and much less permanent than where it is for the service of something greater than self. Now, in the life of the average person growing up today, there is an, an unfortunate lack of nearly any idealistic structure capable of dominating conduct. Small children are not taught that conduct is of great importance to them. They drift along under some circumstances reasonably well, other times not so well. Some are miserably uh, uh, neglected and left to develop the best they can. The condition of children today is very poor, generally speaking. On the other hand, the individual, the parent, 
should understand the responsibilities of his own office. A parent who leaves children to be neglected is injuring himself far more than he could possibly do by some obvious act of delinquency. We have to use the divine powers that are given to us to serve the divine needs of our fellow men. We must use them as they were intended to be used, not to make life more comfortable for ourselves, but to make life more important for those in great need. We have today a world in great need. We have hundreds of millions of people on the verge of starvation. Therefore, it becomes particularly unfortunate in these days to use the needs, sorrows, miseries, and sufferings of other people as the basis of improving our own economic condition. This is not good white magic. White magic is also the development of the love principle. Actually, as Plato pointed out, the end of all wisdom is to understand faith. It is to understand the real deep relationship between the human being and his creator. And this relationship is divine love. And this divine love is transmitted from generation to generation and from level to level of culture to become the basis of personal and impersonal affection. There is love of God, love of country, love of beauty, love of family. There are all kinds of affection, but they are all, to a leisure, magical. Love is one of the great magical powers because it transforms the individual in whom it is real. When we really love someone, we cannot abuse them, we cannot cheat them, we cannot do things to them which is, will be to their detriment. Therefore, love carries with it sacrifice for a cause, uh, sacrifice for a loved person, sacrifice for love of God, sacrifice for love of country. Always love is unselfish. And as far as it is unselfish, it is white magic. If it becomes <coughs> selfish, it turns gray, and if it is selfish enough, it will turn black. But in the normal, proper way of things, it should be just a little off-white. Occasionally, we can be excused for a minor slip into something of a personal nature, maybe a little too much so. But for the benefit of the world in general, a person who loves truly is an asset to his world and is strengthening himself above any discipline that he might take to improve his character. So we have now the, uh, the basis of white magic, service, sacrifice, and dedication. We have the individual using the power of God for the good of man, using the mysterious resources of the universe to make life happier and safer for those who live with us and for those who come after us. This means that the true white magic has to be the result of a considerable internal insight the individual must really and surely believe that the energies, resources, powers, and integrities that he possesses were given to him to use for a common cause. He is to be better not for his own sake alone, but for the world in which he lives. And if he becomes better, his world immediately improves. There is a mysterious magic here also. The complainer always lives in a poor world. But as he rises above his own limitations and transmutes his own attitudes, he suddenly finds the world is a lot better than he thought it was. Always white magic is the power to see good and to grow and to do things more effectively for the sake of humanity in general. Now we go to the opposite end of this and see what we can do with black magic. Black magic is another factor we've had with us from the time of the Greeks, Romans, Persians, and Hindus. Black magic has always been a source of fear, a source of dread. It has controlled people by terrorizing them. It has controlled individuals by threatening them with psychic forces or for psychic disasters. At one time I knew a case in which an individual was nearly frightened to death because he belonged to an organization which he finally discovered was not what it ought to be, and he asked to resign and decided to resign. 
and he was told by a member of the organization that if he tried to resign or left them, he would be magically destroyed. He, he, he survived it, but uh, it was a bad time for a while. Sorcery is also black magic. The, in old days, sorcery uh, was often a, a black magician making a circle in the earth at the crossroads of two main highways, standing in the midst of his circle and invoking spirits with magic charms. Another favorite spot for these, this type of activity was the local graveyard. It was always assumed that the ghosts and the spirits were available. And most of the ghosts and spirits that appear in the old books are rather unpleasant looking figures. Some of them are, are actually rather terrifying if you want to accept them literally. But it is also true that these spirits and these ghostly things were part of a way of controlling people. They were terrorizing many individuals and even today among primitive people or semi-primitive people this terrorizing continues. It is the individual held from the freedom of his own life by fear, by anxiety, by the belief that someone has power to destroy him. Many years ago, in several countries, there was a form of mentalism developed in which individuals took lessons in how to influence other people's thinking. All you had to do was sit very quietly, meditate, say certain holy names, and turn the attention to this distant person whom you wish to influence and force them to make the changes that you can cause them to make by the use of magic. That went along quite a while. The exponents did, did pretty well for themselves. And of course the teachers did very well for themselves, as they always do under those conditions. And then came the deluge. And suddenly these people who were out influencing others realized that others could be influencing them at the same time. And that was all different. We wished to influence other people to do what we want, but we didn't want them to influence us to do what they want. And so it, the whole group of nervous breakdowns resulted in which individuals were frightened to death that others were using on them what they had been trying to use on each other. So this gradually faded out. It wasn't so good anymore. It became obvious that all over-influence can work both ways. And when it starts to work in reverse, it loses its interest. But comes a source of greater fear and anxiety. Black magic is represented in a heavy literature called grimoires. These are little uh, penny productions, most of them forgeries, accredited to great teachers of the past. One is the grimoire of St. Augustine, another is the grimoire of St. Thomas Aquinas, then there is a grimoire of Aristotle. All different names of famous people have been put on books made up of funny magical characters that don't spell anything and in languages nobody can read, but were supposed to carry charms for the control of spirits. And in the black magic societies, it was assumed that there was an infernal equivalent to the divine hierarchy. As there was a god, though there was a devil. As this god was served by all kinds of uh, angels and archangels and thrones and dominations and powers, so the infernal god was served by all forms of evil being. And so one such evil being, of course, <coughs> is the hero in the Faust story of Mephistopheles. But anyway, these uh, evil spirits became a hierarchy, and uh, lessons were given in it, and in the doing these things, and many famous people are believed to have signed pacts with uh, uh, fallen angels to have all the powers of the world for a certain length of time and they lose their own souls. One who signed such a pact, according to pretty solid tradition at least, was Oliver Cromwell. And the pact ended on a certain day and so did he. So that all these things are part of a great cycle of mystery. Now, black magic is dedicated to the concept of power 
without retribution. It is based upon the idea that it is possible for the human being to conceive and design and invent all kinds of mysterious things for unworthy purposes. It is possible for him to gather wealth by unfair action. And always with these things were little scribbles, little lines of mysterious characters in Greek or Hebrew or Senza or Phoenician or something that nobody could read. Now this kind of brings something to mind that we don't think of very much. What are the great magical alphabets of today? Mathematics. All those formulas on the blackboards, on the institutes of technology, a mysterious abracadabra understood only by those who have been students of the subject. But out of these strange combinations of figures, numbers, various variations, from all kinds of strange things, from the studies of physics and biology and chemistry, there has developed a tremendous number of very strange and not necessarily very wonderful things. Remember now that the motive is the purpose, is the principal factor. Where a thing is done to help mankind, it is white. Where it is done to profit only individuals, or is made to damage some at the expense of others. It is black magic, regardless of whether it is on the level of banking or on the level of agriculture. Motive lies behind everything. If the motive is not basically good, then the individual gets into trouble. Many years ago, I was talking with a, by a physicist from the University of Berkeley on their researches in uh, nuclear weaponry. And I asked him how he slept at night as being part of this program. And he said very simply, he said, well, we don't, uh, we don't, we well, no responsibility. We invent. We don't use. If we invent it and somebody else abuses it, it's their fault, not ours. <laughs> if they want to use it for war instead of for peace, we can't help it. The possibility of preventing it in the first place never occurred to him. But in years ago, several prominent physicists retired rather than to go on into the type of armament that is based upon those funny little figures that look almost exactly like some of the magical characters in the black magi magical books of the Middle Ages. So here we have now skill. We have the ability to invent. And we think of progress in terms of invention. We are so proud of landing somebody on the moon that we can hardly wait to get them on the Mercury. We are so proud of the television that we never give a thought as to what comes over it. We are very proud of the nuclear fission and all that has to do with it. Now we're gaining an inordinate prize over all these computers that we are using for one purpose or another. Nobody, however, gives any thought to the misuse of these things. Once they are invented, you can't take it back. The Egyptians and the Greeks had a lot of knowledge of these subjects, but they gave this knowledge only to initiated members of their esoteric bodies. And they held those initiates under the strongest obligation. One single slip of the tongue could cost the, the initiate his life if he was dedicated to the service of the temple. For his antiquity, it wasn't what you discovered, it's how you used it that determined what kind of a person you are. It wasn't the fact that you were famous because you discovered something. You were famous because you contributed to the common good. That it was a better world because you had lived in it. If that's true, you had a right to have a statue in one of the present public buildings but not simply because you discovered a better weapon with which to kill somebody else. So black magic is the abuse of knowledge, the abuse of the energies of life, the perversion of the principles of science, medicine, law, or religion. Black magic is the use of those values which are divinely available to us, 
for purposes contrary to the will of God and the need of humanity. And where this happens is going to be trouble. There's going to be trouble because you can't break rules without hurting yourself in the long run. So here we now have a world which is largely dominated by the abuse of a privilege, energy, and opportunity. We have a world made up of people who do not care what the consequences are. The only thing they want to do is to make an unreasonable profit over what they discover. Now, narcotics addicts are perfectly willing to buy their necessary drugs by making new addicts. They don't care. But they're laboring in a universe which is not very kindly to those types of attitudes. Somewhere, the disaster happens. We cannot abuse privileges without ultimately suffering physically, morally, mentally, spiritually, and also bringing down our own civilizations in ruin. So the black magicians now probably are mostly in the fields of higher learning. We have an occasional black magician who tries to be kind of smart, has a little circle and a few followers, but doesn't mount to too much. But these great black magicians, these great uh, economic speculators, these tremendous perverters of knowledge, these are the things that worry us. Because we are, we are given things without being given any wisdom to use them. What have we done with these things and why do we talk about progress? Why did we do we say that we are the highest intelligent creation that ever existed? Simply because we are scattering death about the world. Why do we insist upon thinking that there is no responsibility for our conduct? It may be true that the laws of the nation cannot reach us, but the universal law will not forget us. And when the time comes, it will do what is necessary to correct some of this condition. Actually, therefore, I think our main problem is to transform certain black magic into white magic, if we can. Uh, <clears throat> white magic is usage. White magic is direction of usage. We are not dealing in white magic when we sell to anyone who wants to buy nuclear weapons. We are only actually serving the universe where we transmute these nuclear weapons into plowshares and start using instead of abusing the resources of life. This is true everywhere. We are abusing the resources which have been given to us, which would be adequate for us if our own selfishness didn't destroy us. So black magic, in fact and reality, is the use of power to hurt. It is the use of position to enslave. It is to use education as an instrument of industry rather than enlightenment. It is a country which passes laws that are inappropriate to the needs of the people. And most of all, it, it is a, an example which we give to those around us of the abuse of divine privileges. Just as a neglected human being is a blot upon the memory of nature, so this constant abuse and misuse is a constant cause of, of sorrow and misery to all concerned. White magic is use. Gray magic is, say, misuse. Black magic is abuse. And these things will come back to roost. They always do. So we look around and we say, what are these wonderful, gracious gifts for which we are congratulating each other? Well, actually, we do not need to canonize the invention, the inventor of television at the moment. Their contribution to our enlightenment is mostly pathetic and apathetic. And being what we are, most people will not support anything better because they have no background for it. And why have they no background? Education has been used only to create selfish people. Our whole civilization is geared to concepts of gray and black use of the, de of the gifts and powers and privileges that we have received from nature. We are misusing 
knowingly. We know when we are taking narcotics. We know when we are alcoholics. But we do not realize that there is something in us that is just getting into serious trouble. We think it will all end at the grave. That we'll all go to sleep with the ages and no one will know whether we ever lived or not. This is a, a really, to some, as a pessimistic view, but to a great mon number it is an optimistic view. <laughs> they, they definitely hope that their own careers will never catch up with them. But this is a false hope. In nature everything has its payments. Everything has, it must be solved correctly. So we say the old black magic was the time when they uh, created various demons, where they burned cows at the stake because they were enchanted, and there they put people up in, in, the, in position and sentenced them to be burned at the stake or broken on the rack uh, simply because they were godly old people with bad memories. All of these things were looking after the smaller crimes. There was a great fuddle in Germany at one time when a cow went dry and practically all the citizens of the community were blamed for it and one or two actually lost their lives. All this to try to make it sound nice and ornery and even and correct. It all is part of a strange negative magic that has enveloped the human mind or has tainted it with all kinds of ulterior explanations. No one has seemingly wanted to accept, accept the simple fact we are in trouble because we deserve it. This is the last thing we want. And because we do not want to face into the causes of our own difficulties, we have developed a new kind of magic, which we might term for general purposes just plain gray magic. Gray magic is doing some small thing right in order to get away with something bigger that we don't want to have right. It is a partial conversion. Now, uh, every uh, evangelist in, uh, in the olden days knew what these partial conversions were. The individual came down the sawdust track, uh, oh, in great humility, wailing with mishaps that were happening to him, accepting blame for everything he'd ever done, and praying for forgiveness. So he got an absolution from the missionary, and uh, it seemed to be fine. The next year he came down the path again with exactly the same problem. I, I used to know some retired missionaries over here in Pomona, and uh, some of them had actually converted the same person 10 or 15 times. <laughs> uh, the conversion never stuck, because the person only got a repentance for a little while but no basic change in nature. He didn't want to offend God, no. But he didn't think my, my God would mind if he offended everybody else. <laughs> and he was you know, perfectly qualified to be slack in his labor, to overcharge for his products, to mismanage his home, neglect his children, and increase his bank account. This was all that counted, and that and a good religious life. But there was no good religious life under such circumstances. So the conversions didn't hold. Now there are people all over the world today who are studying various forms of mysticism, metaphysics, idealistic philosophy, oriental doctrines, and uh, American Indian uh, medicine principles, all kinds of things. And the studies are good. It's not important whether anybody else agrees with us or not. The real problem is, do we really basically do the thing we believe to be right? But as the time goes on, we find that these people do have the same problems as the, the relapsed sinner has, that they keep right on studying these things. That's right. But using what they learn is a little grimy at times. They keep right on doing the selfish things because they must not allow a spiritual conversion to interfere with a financial career. That's just not possible. If you are having, can make a sharp bargain, you can put a new stained glass window in some church and be regarded as virtuous, 
but inside of your soul the truth is always there. The motives behind what we do make for black or white. If the motive is for show, that's wrong. If, we might, if it's an apology for conduct which is not corrected afterwards, it's wrong. If it's to advance personal position, fame, get into public office, all wrong. And that's why we have such poor public officials, is because the official is judged by his academic standing or his political standing, but not by his moral insights. Unless a person is good, you'll never be a good leader. And a country or a world that depends upon bad people because they are a little smarter will be in trouble to the end. There are laws governing these matters, and these laws are immovable and immutable. So we have to begin to think in our own lives some of these things that constitute magic, the magic of hope, the magic of faith, the magic of love. These are all beautiful things, but if they are perverted, they immediately drop into black magic. The moment selfishness takes over a career, its virtues fade out. The moment the person puts his own advantage first, or tries to use something he knows and possesses to humiliate or humble some other person, all of this is used against him. Though they might say, how is it used against him? After all, one of these days he's going to depart, and nobody knows where he came from, and nobody knows where he goes. And for most people, nobody cares. But the individual must prove to himself that he does not survive or all this thinking is not much good. If there is life after death, and the general consensus of opinion is that it is probable, there are only two ways in which we think of it, either as punishment or as reward. In black magic, the punishment is clearly shown. Every black mag magician must end by being dumped into the hell of his own devising. Every black magic formula, when its virtues are exhausted or its powers are limited, becomes the beginning of eternal damnation. The black magic magician doesn't labor from any false understanding. He knows that he's going to be like Faust in the story. He's going to have 20 or 25 years of the good life and then he's going to be turned over to eternal punishment. Now this is interesting thought. Nobody much probably care much about that today. Uh, but what about uh, narcotics? The individual who is in drugs is going to have highs and big moments for a few years and then he's going to become a complete wreck. And he, no one knows what's going to happen to him after he leaves here. He is doing everything for this one great high. Well, that is very common in black magic. The, the success of the moment, the wealthy marriage, the big settlement, the tremendous raise of price of values, all these things are the, the big highs for which nearly everyone works. Nobody seems to pay any attention to the deep lows. When it comes to the low, the individual is assumed to gradually disappear and we don't hear of him anymore about him. But the old process goes on just the same. Of consequence. I think that the philosophies of old were much better to help people to live than the one life doctrine that we have been nourishing so arduously uh, recently, if we nourished anything. Of course, even, even materialism is not generally popular. Everything is questioned. And the most common question is where do we go from here? A lot of people hope that we don't go anywhere. But it's so possible that they could be wrong. And if they are wrong, they've made the biggest mistake of all. And this is the mistake for which very few people are prepared. Therefore, the virtuous life, and not a virtue in the sense just a, a plain lip goodness, but a deeply integrated, dedicated life, won't do any harm if there is no immortality and will do a great deal of good if there is immortality. Socrates pointed this out very clearly. 
he would either go into silence forever or he would find the answers to the questions that he that had never been answerable in the material world so the a lot depends on what we think about that I would say generally speaking that the average person is not really in very good condition to pass on with his present attitudes something has to be done about them now the point of value is that whatever he does that improves improves him now he doesn't have to wait till he's dead to get his reward integrity is and rich character here and now and the absence of them are is a cause of constant consternation and dismay therefore white magic is something we should all definitely try to contemplate and cultivate white magic is the individual using the divine powers bestowed upon him by an infinite life for the glory of that life for the good of all creatures and for the fulfillment of the daily purpose of human existence we are here to do things that are worth doing and whether we remember for them is not important the thing that is important is the growth we make within ourselves white magic is the basis of growth and black magic is the basis of decay that which neglects to grow falls behind that which does not become better must inevitably become worse so we have a span of years like the mystery temples and schools of antiquity we are all being initiated into a universal wisdom it is around the corner we have carefully avoided it why because it interfered with human purpose our whole idea of greatness was in terms of architecture and statuary we wanted to have a statue in the forum and someone said to one of the roman emperors uh, why is your statue not in the forum we said uh, well i think i would rather that people ask why my statue is not in the forum than ask why it is <laughs> and uh, that's a good answer to a good question but we are all interested in things that are not permanent we all hope to get the house paid for before we go we all hope to leave something to the children we all do all kinds of things but we do not really plan a life we do not make a way of growth we do not make sure that children are worthy of what we leave them we are not sure that they will do better with what we have than we have done which may not be very good everything is neglected in principle and where success is achieved at the expense of principle it's black magic and black magic magic is punishable not by the courts of law but by the divine tribunal or rather by the actual energies themselves that are locked within the living creature we are all of us given a certain allotment we have a life allotment of energy to do what we can for all we can while we're here the idea of, li- of wasting this allotment in Las Vegas or something of this kind is very unrealistic how can we really look around us today and say that we are better than our ancestors we have in the last 50 years more caused more trouble for ourselves and each other than occurred in the life tri- in the previous 2000 years because we have greater privileges we have greater skills we have greater knowledge and always the greater evil comes from the abuse of the greater good so we are now in a very shaky spot already we begin to see the ghosts of compensation and retribution arising we have neglected the realities and wherever this is happening we have fallen into black magic we are also always aware of these false leaders that have led us to punishment and led us to death and war but in our own little personal lives we are leading ourselves in the same direction we haven't the courage to stand up for principles and if we do not if we do not stand up for right principles we will fall under the the penalties of the abuse of principles now this is not punishment in the ordinary sense of the word it is not something waiting to hurt us it is not something that says an eye for an eye or a tooth to a tooth 
It is not, uh, not that at all. Compensation in this case is the inevitable reaction of action. It is the law of energy and motion. It is part of the principle of existence. That as we use, so shall we benefit or lose ground as a result of wrong conduct. We are here with an allotment. If we waste our substances or corrupt them, it is not a God that punishes us. It is the disintegration of our own character that punishes us. It is the fact that we become victims of habits and circumstances that are wrong. The rise of crime in the last 50 years is not necessarily due merely to the fact uh, that the law courts are late negligible. The rise of crime is due to the fact that more people are abusing more principles for personal greed. This is the problem. And where are the educators? Why are we so proud of the individual who can speak Mongolian but have no time to waste on an individual who can make a constructive contribution to society? Why are we so proud of ignorance? Most of our problems today are the consequences of black magic taking over the school system. The school system is now used simply to prepare more people to say, make the same mistakes we are making. We are supposed to prepare individuals to perpetuate our own greed and our own thoughtlessness and our own perversity. We are creating more dummies. And as a result of that, these young people, having no education, turn around and fall into every imaginable crime, which is not because they are necessarily delinquent children, but because they have never received a proper share of the responsibilities of growing up. Now, we can take this same symbolism and use it in connection with our own bodies. We can say that instead of our children, perhaps, we are talking now about our flesh and blood. We have to realize that we are responsible for the proper use of energies. There are things we can't prevent and there are things we can prevent. But in every case, the purpose of civilization is to find ways of doing it better. Now, it does, this doesn't mean bigger computers. It does not mean bigger bombs. It means better use of constructive means to accomplish the growth of society. We are now up to six billion, pretty soon we will be up to eight billion. And of that eight billion, ninety percent will come in and go without the slightest understanding of what life is about. They will not understand what it means to be better. They will not understand that there is anything more important than cash. There is no way of helping these people unless the civilization itself creates what the Oriental calls good karma. As you sow, so shall you reap. And man is in a condition where he is able to see, or should be able to see, that he's making a mess of things. If he can't see that, he really has suffered from a serious astigmatism. <laughs> he knows what he is doing isn't right, but it interferes with things if he tries to change them. Most of all, it hurts him where he suffers the most, in his pocketbook. It takes away from him certain glamour. He isn't regarded with the same favor by his friends. He isn't serving as many cocktails as he used to. All these things are social adjustments which he's afraid to make. He's afraid he'll lose his job. You've got to get to the basis of the situation, and for the average person of today, the basic change must come in the only place where it can come, and that is in the home. It's the only chance that the parents have to really lay a foundation for the lives of their children is in the first six or eight years of that child's life. If it is neglected up to that point, we have another delinquent on his way to glory. Now, this is a problem you can't legislate. You can't force it. But the problem is, is the... Uh, uh, early educator, Comedius, for it well, that the most important school in the world is at the mother's knee. As the child receives enlightenment and correction in the first years of life, so it will be. Now we're going a little further into this matter. We're beginning to realize that this 
It's an example that goes back beyond birth. That the child begins to take on the world the moment it exists within the mother's womb. And that all the habits, attitudes, and ideas of the parents will affect the child long before it is born. This prenatal influence, as it is now generally referred to, is real. And if this prenatal influence could be changed, probably 75% of juvenile delinquency could be cured. But in order to change, the individual has to live a better life before the child is born. Has to have a better consciousness of values when it establishes a family. And all these things interfere with fun. Actually, also, all these, this type of fun interferes with survival. So we have a lot of things to think about in the use of these mysterious psychic forces, energies, these powers which we use in the directing of what we call magic. Magic is nothing but an actually normal process in nature. Everything is magical. Every the growth of a flower is magical. The singing of a beautiful song is. The creation of a great work of art. All of these things are part of a divine magic. We see that magic in the perfect formation of the, the wings of a butterfly. We see this in the scene by the riverside. We see it in the moving streams and in the clouds. Everything we look at, there's something beautiful, something wonderful, something significant. And even the adversities of nature are still magnificent. Even though we cannot appreciate all of them, for the most part, we live in a world that is kind to us. Having this type of world, why can't we perpetuate it? Why cannot we continue to build a civilization that is worthy of the material that has been given to us to work with? Why do we have to struggle year after year to get peace between countries or to get peace between gods? Why do we have to fight so hard to use energies which were intended and created for the purpose of contributing to beauty and well-being? Gradually, for some unknown reason, hard to diagnose, we have become supremely selfish. And every selfish person falls into black magic in one way or another. Can't avoid it. Because selfishness puts our personal desires in front of all other considerations in life. And the more we do that, the more trouble we'll be in. So we can say what is gray magic now for just a few minutes. Well, gray magic is a kind of middle distance in which an individual can have a smug sense of righteousness while they're doing wrong. <laughs> that they are just so perfect they can hardly stand it, but nobody can live with them. Gray magic is the realization of duty, but duty done so painfully that no one wants it done. It is actually the problem of, of covering a great deal of de deficiency a kind of light glamour of I did, I, I did my best. I tried hard. And everyone else suffered more than I did while I was trying. <laughs> so we have people who are just, just trying to be good and making a miserable job of it. And it also seldom as ever really cleans up a disposition. The individual trying so desperately to be good may be the worst critic in society. They're always finding something wrong with others and giving thanks they are not like others. <coughs> and the others wish they uh, were anything but what they are. So green magic is, is covering a deficiency without admitting it, or by passing over it lightly. The individual says, well, I can't be all bad, I pay all my bills and if I don't go in debt, or if my, my wife and I go to church every Sunday, all these things sound as though the individual was doing pretty well. But he doesn't mention on the side that he's closed for foreclosing a mortgage somewhere. That's just plain business. You don't count that. So that uh, the gray magic is a person who may in some things actually behave pretty well. But his covering up something that he doesn't want to change. He doesn't want to be unselfish. 
He'll be a little bit unselfish. He'll buy a couple of tickets to the fireman's ball or something. But he doesn't really want to go all out for a better world. He wants to go all out for what he wants. And uh, these people become more or less pacemakers. They're the ones that so-called respectable citizens copy and try to do likewise. So I say that gray magic is the covering of large faults with small virtues. It is the individual who hasn't quietly thought through his own personal attitudes towards life. He hasn't become truly honest. He's just honest enough so he won't get caught. The integrities of things are not what count. It's to be borderline, to get as close to trouble as possible and stay out of it. This type of thing, again, is energy. And the whole thing breaks down to one thing. We have one life. We have one life power. We have one tremendous energy. We have this divinely given spark of divinity within ourselves. We are therefore stewards in the garden. We are servants in the house of the Lord. We have this tremendous gift, the gift of divinity. We are divine. We are just as surely divine as the greatest star or the most distant and remote galaxy. Everything is life, one great life. And that great life is here as available to us and to use with many promises of world peace, of better nations, better health, better, less, less poverty, less crime, all these things that would come from doing it right. And white magic is nothing but the acceptance of the responsibility of God-given life. And that this responsibility is something we must face and we must fulfill. And sometime we will be weighed in the balance like the Egyptian in the papyrus. We shall be weighed in the balance and we must be considered and judged to be just, to be right. And we must try in our own lives to manifest these things because every misuse is an inescapable defect. We never get away with it. It may disappear in a mass of circumstances and we may never see it again but it's there. And the only way that we can do that is right is to build up our treasures uh, where thieves cannot take them away. We will end thievery when we are rich in values that nobody can earn except ourselves and no one can take away from us but, but our own compromises. So we go back and we see the old timers. We see the magicians of old. We see the old witch doctors mumbling with their bones. We see the courtly courts of Europe, each with a magician, to attempt to achieve what the Lord of the house wants. We see everywhere a belief. And we are told now that we must be more careful and not have so many superstitions. These superstitions are not good for us. We shouldn't believe in fantastic things like astrology. Strategy is making the headlines right at the moment. <laughs> and uh, about to, we might remember Theodore Roosevelt always had his horoscope on the wall over his desk. All kinds of things like that. And we get worried about this. But we're not worrying as to where the heavy water goes. And we're not worrying properly about what is being done to end various religious confusions. God made one energy, and it's whether a Christian, a Muslim, a, a Buddhist, a Jew, or a Chinese is embodied in the physical form, but that same one spark of divinity is in every living thing. And regardless of any other thought, that spark of divinity is the basis of a comradeship that can never be broken. It is the basis of an infinite understanding that must come. Maybe not right now, but it's got to come. Because there is only one life. There isn't one life for one sect and another life for another sect, nor is there a God for one sect and another sect. There are 72 names of God, but only one God. Everywhere, we must find these values that are deep enough 
to rescue us from the small petty injustices that we constantly wreck upon each other. We've got to find out the facts of life. And where we will pick up a dish of food to eat, this is magic. The digestive system is a mystery we can't solve very easily. We get explanations, but there's still a lot of it we don't understand. We don't understand the life in food. We know it's there. We don't understand why the alchemists, searching for the mystery of the transmutation um, of metals and elements, finally came to the opinion that Paracelsus held that the digestive system of the human body is the perfect example of the transmutation of metals. All these things we have. We have all the evidence necessary to solve most of our problems. We won't understand everything, but we would be able to make such improvements as would put a world into existence that we have never thought even possible. But we just drift along, toying with the small circumstances of life, wasting time. We're not educating ourselves. We're not doing anything that we really should be doing. That is, in the majority. A few understand and are working very hard. And it's nice to know that they're increasing in number every day. But they're not a majority as yet. But we are looking forward to a new century in which other things will happen. But in order that they must happen, more people must now and here take on the responsibilities of intelligent living. To make things worthwhile is finally to gain the supreme happiness, a peaceful world in which everyone is doing the thing that he believes, everyone living well with all others, all feuds and jealousies gone, is, it, it would bring paradise to earth, and it can be done. But it will only be done when we use the divinity in ourselves to release the God in us into manifestation in the world around us. It is the God in us that must take over the management of our personal lives. And when it does so, it will share this management constructively and right properly with the management of all other lives. There is no division of truth and there is no union of error. The truth can be found always to build and increase and add. Error is forever dividing, separating, and tearing down. We can never bring error together, but we can bring one truth into manifestation. And when we do that, we will have a far better world and a better chance for the peace that we seek for. So each person in some small way, it doesn't have to be anything very startling, but each person in some way should try to realize that he is a kind of garden and that in his heart has been sowed an immortal seed, the seed of his own glory, the seed of God in him. And it's time for him to keep his garden weeded and take care of that seed and make sure that the seed of truth in his own heart has a chance to grow up and manifest and bear fruit before it is completely choked out by the false values with which we are surrounding ourselves at this time. Magic is always here. Things will always be mysterious, and they can always also be wonderful. It is almost entirely up to ourselves how these things shall go. So I think that we do have something to realize in, uh, well, so we say, the uh, use of magic. Magic of healing is going to gradually take the place of all the remedies and dopes that with which we are afflicted now. Um, the magic of legation will find honesty and will find who is right. The magic of leadership will give us proper government. The, ma the magic of love, enduring homes. The right use of that with which we have been divinely endowed is white magic. It is to do that which was intended and to be rewarded as good and faithful servants instead of allowing ourselves to be kicked around because we reject the very values which would give us permanence. I think we have all this to think about as we come to the end of the century. We have all this to think about as we pass through the years of our own lives. The great magic is the magic of transmutation and transformation. And uh, the Rosicrucian mystics held this to be divinely true, and so did Jacob Bamey, the great German theosophist. It is that the redeeming, redeeming power, the transmuting power of love will make all things well, 
and the poison of hate will gradually cease to dominate in human concerns. But we must change. We cannot have hate and love at the same time. In the Persian mysteries, the two great deities, Ormuz and Adamon, were the, the good and evil principle, the god and anti-god. Actually, in the mythology, they were brothers, born of the same parents, one to save and the other to destroy. And this peculiar symbolism goes down through most of Persian philosophy. But in the end of it all, the uh, brother who was evil, Arman, comes to back to his brother, almost, and bows before him and kneels before him and says, I now have had my fill of this. I know you were right. Therefore, I surrender my separate power and return it to you where it belongs. And it's the same thing we have. There is a, a seed within us of self and not self. There is something that has to do with the better part of ourselves. Then there is something that has to do with our appetites and our desires. Our most is the better self. Ariman is the false self. And after many incarnations and embodiments in which evil tries desperately to destroy good, where the city of Babylon seems to rise triumphantly over the city of God as described by St. Augustine. In the end, all that is wrong comes and bows before all that is right and says there is but one God, and that God is love. And we might as well begin pretty soon to find these things out. We consider ourselves to be educated people. We believe we know a lot, but we do not know enough yet to be truly kind in the big emergencies of life. And we do not know how to keep faith in the little things in which we could, if we only thought a little, improve our lives, strengthen our homes, and reduce many of the difficulties from which we suffer. We could end waste. We could end privation. We could end all these things if we gave the divine spark that ensouls us the right to fulfill its purposes through the personalities which we call ourselves. So with that type of thought in mind, I think maybe we can all be a little bit better magicians in transforming the negatives of life into something beautiful. A wave of the wand and the flower can bloom. And it is up to us to make sure that in our lives and hearts we are faithful servants of the spirit in us, that internal seed which wants to grow. And until it has a chance to grow, we will never have any peace in our own lives, and there will never, or nor will we have any peace in the outside world. That which we was created in us flows through us into all others. And the word that was made flesh becomes the word that was made soul. And as soul, it becomes a universal healer, the medicine the hope of nations. Well, I guess that's it, folks. <laughs> now, I'd like to, I'd like to uh, take this opportunity to mention that at 7.30 tonight, 7.30 tonight, uh, the, uh, my wife is having a meeting of the Veritas Foundation in the lecture hall here, is going to discuss many of the terms, thoughts, and ideas that are becoming more prevalent and more useful every day in building a better practical world in which to live and fulfilling the destiny for which we are intended. I thank you very much for being with us.